Thanks for coming out tonight. We're lucky to uh, have Dr. Peter E. speaking with us as part of our academic speaker series for 2012-2013. Uh, now, most of us know Dr. Eden and his role as president of Landmark College. However, before he came to Landmark, Dr. Eden served as the Dean of Arts and Sciences and the Professor of Biotechnology at Endicott, Endicott College in Massachusetts. Also, he was a tenured Associate Professor and Chair of the Science Department at Marywood University in Pennsylvania. And also, a research fellow at the Jackson Laboratory and a visiting professor at the College of Atlanta. Atlantic, excuse me. Both of which are in Maine. Uh, I have a, a graduate from the College of Atlanta, right? Um, Dr. Eden uh, earned his undergraduate degree at the University of Massachusetts and completed his PhD work from the University of New Hampshire and he did postdoctoral training in microbiology, molecular biology, and neurobiology at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He also has done research and, and well, he has research and management experience in the biotech and pharmaceutical industries. So you've been pretty busy. Uh -huh. I'm pretty old. <laughs> uh, he's also married and has two children, and he likes to mountain bike. <laughs> <laughs> I, I used to mountain bike until I had children. I need to update that bike. All right. So we're thrilled to have him, and would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Eden. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Can you hear me all right? Yes? Yes. yes. Good. Uh, thanks, Professor. This is a really a wonderful seminar series. And um, what I want to do right now is uh, step you through some, some uh, molecular and cellular biology and some genetics and genomics, okay? I think what you might want to do is, if you have a question, just raise your hand. If something's not clear, raise your hand, ask a question, okay? And uh, the first 15 minutes or so is really going to be a, uh, uh, I don't want to call it a tutorial, just a, some background in fundamental genetics and genomics, all right? You really, really must understand DNA, nucleotide sequences, okay? Some basics of genetics and genomics. You must get that in order for us to turn the corner later on in the talk when we start to discuss how to find a gene in your whole genome, whether or not it's a good idea for insurance companies to have your entire genetic information. Okay? And why it's so difficult to find one gene that causes one multifactorial trait. Okay? So it really does hinge on you getting a pretty good grasp of what a gene looks like, what DNA is made out of. Because once you know that, you'll, you'll then understand how in a laboratory setting we can pick little bits of a chromosome and actually try to find some genes. Okay? So post-genome era, what is that? Well, it's the period following the completion of the human and other genome sequencing. And other, I mean other organisms, okay? Rice, cats, fish, any organism. Oak tree, we all have a genome. Now, what is a genome? It's the complete set of genetic information, DNA, in a cell or an organism. That's your genome. Genomics is what the study of gene function, how changes in your genetic makeup, such as mutations, or versions of genes called alleles, affect the whole organism. That's genomics. Now, as an aside, proteomics. Proteomics is another field of study. Proteins are the products of genes, okay? Proteins actually do the work in your cells, in your body. Proteins are what ultimately are responsible for diseases and behavior. Okay? So that's the field of proteomics. It's great to understand genomics and all of your genes, but then on the other hand, it's wonderful to understand what are all these little molecules that make us who we are. 
Sure, the genes are the blueprint. Proteins do the work. Wait. Good, wait. You might inherit some genes. A faulty gene which gives you a certain aberrant protein. It's the protein that the drug industry goes after to stop the growth of a tumor cell. Okay? Proteins are these physical things. So we're going to focus mostly on genomics today, but proteomics is huge. So let me ask you, what constitutes physically and structurally the human genome? Who knows? <coughs> What's the human genome made out of? DNA is the molecule. Good. DNA is the chemical. The, the chemical. Good. Somebody describe the human genome to me. Isn't it? Like, I'm not really positive about this. That's okay. It's a safe environment. It's Even though you're being filmed and you're on TV, you can say anything you want. <laughs> Go. Isn't it the, sequ like the specific sequencing of types of DNA mm. that kind of make of a specific mm, person. Mm, it's good. Good answer. Good answer. You're both right. Still looking for more, though. Good job. Somebody describe the human genome to me right now. Yeah? Is it kind of like the blueprint to build a human? It is. Okay. It is. Physically, someone, someone, what do they call? What are these long molecules called that we inherit? Chromosomes. Chromosomes. How many do we have? 23. Tw 23? Pairs. 23. 23. Good. 23 <laughs> pairs, right? 23 pairs, is that right? Good. We get one from mom and we get one from... Right, everyone? All right. In a sperm cell or an egg cell, how many chromosomes are there? If most of our cells made of 23 pairs of chromosomes, how many are in an egg cell? Good. So how many are in a sperm cell? When they get together, what do you get? 23 pairs, right? Newly formed embryo. Good. Okay? Good. That's good. Now, this is so, such an old school photo. I can't believe I still use it. It makes me feel so old. This, this, here are the, here are the, uh, I think it's human looking at the shape of them. These, this is um, a micrograph of, of the human genome. Okay? Now, one thing's for sure. Let's take a look at, what's your favorite chromosome pair, folks? <laughs> Come on, you got to. Hey, one. All right. So, Chromosome pair one, okay? It, it very rarely looks like this in your cells, okay? Very rarely. Only at a certain point of cell division do your chromosomes get all together, okay? So they can, they can copy themselves and be pulled apart. What's that called? When your cells divide. Cell division. Right? Like the word begins with an M. Mitosis. Good, good, good. Nevertheless, folks, most of the time in your cell, Chromosomes are very, very diffuse, long molecules made out of DNA. But sometimes they actually do tighten up and they look like this, all right? And they can be pulled apart. When you look in textbooks, they always have these, these uh, structures and, and you, you automatically think that that's what a chromosome. It's actually a really, really tightly coiled, extremely long molecule. So we'll go into um, some detail about that next. I'll give you a flash of it. We're going to do a little bit of that in a minute. What I want you to understand now is, is uh, in this talk, we're going to talk about taking cells from a human being, like uh, cheek cells, okay, or cells from uh, pluck your hair. Every single one of your cells, each cell has, got it? Understand? Every single cell has your genome. 23 pairs of chromosomes. You got that one from mom, you got that one from? You're a hybrid, we're all hybrids. Okay, now, remember, egg cells and sperm cells don't have, they're not diploid, right? They don't have 23 pairs, they have 23. Right. So when you look in forensics and you look at blood cells in a forensics analysis, you're looking for DNA, what kinds of cells are you looking for to, to access DNA from that crime scene? Absolutely. Excuse me? Absolutely. No? Good thinking. Not quite. What's in a blood? What's in blood? What kinds of cells are in blood cell? Or is in blood? What kind of cells are in blood? White. Good. 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 When you swab a little bit of blood from a forensics crime scene, you're looking for a white blood cell because a white blood cell will have the entire genome of that organism. What about red blood cells? Hemoglobin. There's a molecule. It's not DNA though. No, it's andro. It's excellent. Red blood cells. Yeah. 
red blood cells don't have a nucleus. That's right. Red blood cells do not have a genome. Nice. All right. So, folks, here's an artist's interpretation of a cell. Um, here's a nucleus. And there is, what is this? This is an artist's interpretation. Remember I told you they don't really look like this all the time, but it's a nice way to, to draw the picture. And this is the artist's uh, way of telling you that if you unwound one of these chromosomes, 23 pairs of chromosomes in pretty much every one of our cells, half of the, from mom, other half from dad, you're going to get this long molecule called DNA. And there's that double helix, right? That you see all the time, the double helix. So deoxyribonucleic acid, that's the chemical that makes up um, a DNA and chromosomes, and we inherit these chromosomes from our parents. Okay? Now, focus right down here. Don't look at that stuff. Let's talk about what DNA does. Let me jump up one more. I want you to remember one thing. Up and down each chromosome, there are stretches, stretches of the chromosome called genes. Okay? Lengths called genes. The genes give an instruction for a protein. Okay? That's what DNA does. Look right here. DNA, which is the stuff your genome is made out of, gets transcribed to a molecule called messenger RNA. It's really a copy of the gene. The messenger RNA gets translated to this molecule called the protein. This all happens inside your cells at the ribosome. All right? So if you've got a gene on chromosome 11, and that gene gets turned on, <coughs> that gene makes a copy of itself called a messenger RNA molecule. That mRNA molecule gives the instructions to make a protein. Okay? Oh, by the way, <laughs> by the way, if you inherit a mutated gene, would that make a mutated mRNA and then maybe a messed up protein? Yes. Right, right, right. Good. If you smoke cigarettes and that those mutagenic molecules get into your lung cells and they mutate the DNA and the genes in the genome of your lung cells, could that make a messed up mRNA and therefore a messed up protein? Could that? Yes. Could that cause the cell to keep keep dividing? What's that called? Cancer. Good. Good. So you can inherit mutations, right? You can also gain them. So we talked about a stretch of DNA with a gene on it. Make, when it's turned on, think of insulin, right? You know, insulin, the insulin gene. Boy, you need that protein insulin, don't you? Isn't that important for grabbing sugar into your cells? So, boy, you eat some candy, eat some food, and your body says, I, I need some insulin. Your insulin gene gets turned on, and it makes an insulin messenger RNA. That molecule goes over to this big structure in your cells. Um, even E. coli, even bacterial cells have 20,000 of these. So this mRNA, copy of your gene, gives the instructions to make an actual protein. You got a mutation in your gene, it'll show up in your mRNA some of the time, and it could result in a mutated protein. All right? So remember, we're talking about genomics today. We're talking about identifying changes at the genetic level because... Because we think that it could indicate a physical trait. This is a very busy one. Maybe I shouldn't show it. Let me see. Let's take a peek at it, though. It's a little redundant, but I, like, I don't mind redundancy. Okay? Here's a cell. There's the genome. There's the artist's interpretation. Remember, it very rarely looks like that. Looks like the artist is unwinding it. There's your double helix. It's just, a small, it's just chemistry, okay? But now is when you start to see these nucleotide base pairs, A's, T's, C's, and G's, okay? And this is a stretch, let's call that a gene. Now, this gene is going to give the instructions to make, ultimately, to make proteins, okay? Proteins perform many cellular functions. So, see the A, T, C, and G? Really important for this talk. It's a different way of looking at a, at a chromosome, at a molecule of DNA, all right? Uh, it's, don't be confused by this. Do you see this ribbon of phosphates? Do you see this P right here, the stretch? That's like one of the ribbons. Here's another one. You know the ladder-like stuff? 
Those are hydrogen bonds. This is one stretch of DNA. Remember, DNA is typically a double helix, right? In a long stretch of it can be a gene. In many genes, in a long molecule, it's called a chromosome. It's as simple as this, folks. It's all chemistry. DNA is made up of these molecules, a sugar, a <laughs> phosphate, and these things called nucleotides. This is really important for the talk. A's and T's, C's and G's. Okay? They're just carbon-based molecules. Ribose, sugar, phosphate, adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine. Okay? Now, here's a little trick for you, and you need to remember this. This is a double-stranded DNA molecule. See what it looks like there when an artist tries to make it simple for you? This is the actual structure of it. If you heated this molecule up, these are hydrogen bonds. They're not very strong. What would happen to these two strands of DNA if you heated it up? They would peel apart, right. You know, when we heat up our bodies, it damages us, right? It can damage our DNA. But I want you to remember one thing. When you have a strand of DNA here and a strand of DNA there, when they're together, they make a nice double helix, functional gene and chromosome. When you heat them up and peel them apart, they'll come back together again. But an A will only hydrogen bond to a what? G. Right. A G will only hydrogen bond to a? C. Good. Good. Love it. Remember that. Remember that, because we're going to talk about something. We're going to talk about finding a little thing called a probe that will lie down on and stick to a very specific gene or a really specific region of a chromosome. All right? All based on the following. Complementarity. A's bind to T's. C's bind to... It's just chemistry. So let me give you a little quiz. If on... Somebody name a good chromosome. We already did one. 21. 21. If on chromosome 21, right in the middle, there was a big long stretch of G's, right? And you wanted to make like a little molecule with a radioactive tag on the end. And you wanted it to stick right on that. Right in the middle of chromosome 21, there's a big long stretch of G's. You wanted to be able to detect that somehow. And you had the ability to make a long molecule just of C's with a little radioactive tag on the end, or some little flag on the end, which we, we can do easily. If you heated up that DNA and that chromosome 21 split apart, and you added that probe, remember that long strand of C's with a little flag on the end? Would it go down and anneal to? Would it hybridize to? Would it stick to? Anywhere on the genome? What would a long molecule only of C's with a little flag on the end? If you heated up, if you heated up the DNA in that, in that sample in your test tube, heated it up so the DNA all peeled apart, and you had a long molecule made only of C's and then a little flag on the end. You added that to the tube and you swirled it around. Where would, all the, where would that molecule anneal to? It only stick to the G's. And where are those G's? Where are you going to find a long stretch of G's in the human genome? In the middle of chromosome? 21. Got it? You guys got that? Let's say you knew the sequence of the insulin gene. It was T, 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 A, 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 A. Could you make a little probe? A, 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 what did I say? <laughs> Could you make a little molecule with a little flag on the end? Yes. Could you? No. Yeah, you could. You could. Synthetic biology, you can. When you add that to the human genome, all melted, will that sit down only on the insulin gene? You guys get it? Yes. Good. Because we know the sequence of lots of parts of the human genome, we can make little molecules that will stick to only that spot. Okay? We'll go into that more in a minute. <coughs> that was a little exercise so you appreciate that DNA is a double-stranded molecule. It makes up big chromosomes. We have 23 pairs in each of our cells, pretty much. It is really just a molecule. It's just chemicals. And it's made up of these long stretches and these nucleotides. They hold the key to homing in on sequences in our genome. Now, Human Genome Project. In our genome, there are about 3 billion nucleotides. 
How many is a billion? What kind of a number is a billion? How many million is one billion? How many, how many, how many? Uh -uh. One billion is a thousand, a thousand million? See how big a billion is? When people talk about, oh, the earth is four billion years old, what's a billion? A thousand million? It's huge. Billion nucleotides, A's, T's, C's, and G's. That's how big our genome is. People feel that there are about 20,000 genes all across our genome. But we produce about 100,000 proteins. How is that possible? How is that possible? We've got this huge genome, 23 <laughs> pairs of chromosomes. By the way, it's not as big as, I think it's a lilac or something, a lily. Just because you have a huge genome doesn't mean you're a more sophisticated organism. If we've got about 3 billion nucleotides, huge number, people feel that there are about 20,000 genes. Remember, what does a gene do? A gene makes a molecule ca called mRNA. The mRNA gives the instructions for what? Proteins. Good. Good. So if you've got 20,000 genes, how the heck could you have 100,000 proteins? Who knows the answer to this? Anyone? Any molecular biologists out there? Can a gene make several proteins? Yep. A gene can make several types of proteins. Good. Also, proteins can be cleaved and processed in different ways. So one gene can make one protein, but ends up being a couple different proteins. Good. Pretty efficient, isn't it? Imagine how inefficient it would be if we had to have one gene for every single protein. So we've evolved that way. So we've got a lot of genes, even more proteins. So this kind of speaks to this issue. If 99.9% .9 of our genomes are identical, look, at it, look around the room, you don't have to. We're quite different, aren't we, in many ways? But we are, 99.9% .9 of our genomes are identical. How are we so different? Good, good. Because of the sheer enormity, 0.1% difference between us is actually an enormous amount of genetic difference, okay? When you hear that primates are 99.5% similar to humans, it's like, oh my god. But if you think of it, 0.5% of a genome that huge is thousands of different types of genes. So that's why we are so alike in many ways but even a 0.1% difference means there's a lot of genetic diversity between every one of us. Now, it's true that individuals differ in health, behavior, and our responses to things. Re response to a drug, response to a stimulus. So the question is, does that 0.1% difference in our genome hold the key to understanding the differences in this behavior? It's quite possible that the differences we see among others could be because of the genetic variation. <coughs> so one of the goals, folks, for genomics and science in general is correlate the DNA sequence difference, differences with disease conditions, predisposition to disease, etc. One of the goals is to try to correlate DNA sequence differences between people to differences with disease conditions, predisposition of disease, etc. Look for an organism that shares a trait. Let's say it's a disease pathology. And see whether or not they share some genetic similarities that the healthy, the healthy individual does not. We'll talk about that a bit when we talk about finding the cystic fibrosis gene among all of those chromosomes. Now, how do you do this? How the heck do you go and pick around someone's genome? It's easy. Access to our DNA is very, very easy. Look for genetic markers in the lab. It's called genotyping. <coughs> Let me stop right there, though, in case anybody needs a, we need to pause. Is accessing our DNA really easy? How could you get a sample of someone's entire genome right now? Yeah. You have to take a swab from there. Swab from what cheek? All right, okay. What if the person said, no way, you're not swabbing my cheek? Blue hair. Blue hair. Bottle of water. Oh, wait a minute. You mean saliva? Mm -hmm. 
In your saliva, what, what's in your saliva? Probably thousands of what? Bacteria. Bacteria. Oh, hey, wait, who said bacteria? You're right. But um, along with the bacteria are what? A lot of our own cheek cells and everything? You're right. How about a cigarette butt? Is there saliva on that? Do you think there are any of our own cells on that? Yes. Better believe it. Do we have cells sloughing off of us, dead cells, right now? Yeah. Does every single cell have a nucleus? What's inside the nucleus of every one of our cells? 23 pairs of chromosomes. Got it? Pretty easy, isn't it, to get our genome? Kind of scary, too. Very easy to get your entire genome. All right. So, fortunately, in the lab, boy, it's easy. Just, you just need a tissue sample, right? Not even tissue, saliva, right? Or a swab, or a hair follicle. Thousands of cells, and each cell has 23 pairs of chromosomes, because it all started from one egg and one sperm and divided your entire genome. Because of molecular biology, we have ways to look for different genetic markers in your genome. It's microscopic, can't see it, but any small sample from you you can look for genetic markers. What are genetic markers? Good question. Genetic markers are very specific sequences on our chromosomes, which are easy to detect in a lab. And you, you've just made a good point. We're going to talk about how genetic markers are easy to find when we don't know where most of the genes are. All right? Genetic markers are going to be our way to walk around the genome. Sure. Genetic markers, these are really easily identified stretches of DNA in a chromosome. And General Lee, we're gonna, when we move on, it'll be clear to you then too, okay? If you don't catch it right now. So we're going to talk about it for a little bit. Okay. Genetic variation and genotyping. Why is all this important? Here's why, gang. We believe that this will provide better abilities in terms of diagnosis, treatment, in prevention. If we know the genetic changes <coughs> in the genes associated with different disease conditions, could we determine whether or not someone might get an early diagnosis that they have a gene which might lead them to develop cancer? Yep. <coughs> See this treatment thing? We're going to talk about that in a minute. When you know something about genetics and genomics, you know something about proteins. Didn't we talk about DNA gets, gives the instructions for proteins? Yeah. Good. And also prevention. We talk a, well, maybe a little bit about vaccines and how to prevent a disease condition because you know that you have a certain genetic marker or not. All right. Fortunately, we already talked about this a bit. How do you detect a mutated gene or any genetic marker. We've already determined that it's easy to get our genome, isn't it? Right? Sure is. A nucleotide sequence differences. This is a gross simplification, but look at this. Let's just say on chromosome 7, at the top of chromosome 7, which has like thousands of genes up and down it, there's a healthy gene. It makes a protein which helps us, I don't know, digest food or something or whatever. Here's the sequence of the healthy gene. See that? That gene would get converted. Well, a copy of that gene would be called messenger RNA. It would go over to a ribosome. And it would make a healthy protein, and your cell would be perfectly happy. But you inherited a mutated version. Or something happened in the environment which insulted or traumatized the gene and caused a genetic mutation. So the mutated version is, look at the nucleotide change. See that? Now remember what we talked about, folks. If you've got a mutated gene, this gene, a copy of this gene is called mRNA, right? It would go to a <laughs> ribosome and make what molecule? Genes make mRNA molecules, which give the instructions for what important molecule? Proteins. Good. Here's the deal, though. If you, have a, if you have a mutated gene, we can tell the difference, because look at the nucleotide difference there. A couple of Gs. Shouldn't be a couple of Gs there. But we know that, so we can make a little probe. We can make a little molecule that will detect that. 
As a matter of fact, this is actually, this isn't even new. This is about 10 years old. If you're looking, let's just say, now remember, this is, a real, this is really simplified. So it's not this simple. But we know the sequence of the human genome now. We certainly don't know all the genes, but we know the sequence of a lot of them. And we actually know the sequence of a lot of mutated versions of them which can cause disease. So if you have this mutated gene at the top of chromosome 7, let's just say this might predispose you to pancreatic cancer, which is not good. Not good at all. How are you going to know if you have this mutated gene until you wait until you're in your 60s or something and develop pancreatic cancer? Can you get your, gene, your DNA tested? Yes. And look at this. Even this thing. This thing came out a long time ago. It's called an AmpliChip device. A clinician would take a sample of your blood. What's in your blood? White blood cells? Do white blood cells have your entire genome? Yes. Right. This thing is a handheld AmpliChip device. It will take a little bit of the patient's blood. Guess what it does to the low? It's all built into this thing. <coughs> it's just a little tool that will crack open the white blood cells access all of those genes, and it will detect a specific mutation. And bang, it'll show up. I won't show you the technology because it gets kind of complicated, but you can actually look for hundreds and hundreds of genes at once. Because we know, because of genomics and because of the human genome being sequenced, we now know what to look for in terms of mutated genes. And it's not really a laborious, week-long process to get the DNA and clone the <coughs> gene and amplify the gene. And now, it's called in situ, there are devices which will access the patient's DNA in a literally have a little flag or a little probe that will sit down only on the defective gene and send a little signal out. Pretty powerful, huh? Now, folks, don't forget, when I started this talk, how are we doing? Uh-oh. When I started this talk, remember we talked about genomes being humans and other <laughs> organisms? Does that include viruses and bacteria? Yes. Good. You should see the kinds of developments that people are coming up with to identify whether Bacillus anthracis, that's the bacterium that causes anthrax. There are all kinds of tools which exist now to use genomics to say, oh my gosh, is that organism present? You're not going to grow Bacillus anthracis in the lab for three days, look at it under a microscope and say, yep, you got anthrax in the building. You're not going to do that. You're going to say, I don't need to grow anything. I can look for the Bacillus anthracis gene markers. Okay? That's the power of molecular biology. No waiting around, but it's rife with caveats, which we'll talk about. Let's look at an example of some of the benefits of genomics. Genomic medicine, benefits and therapeutic platforms. There are diagnostic benefits. For example, early detection, cancer predisposition genes. Remember we talked about that, pancreatic cancer? If there were a gene or genes which predispose one, what's the benefit of early detection, really early detection of maybe being susceptible to cancer? You can figure out um, with any disorder or disease how to, how to treat it, but also how to help Good. give a child the best possible accommodation. Good. Good. Especially with a child with a learning disability, if you're able to find that out, you can ah. help them. Okay. Well, that's very complicated. We're going to talk about that at the end. Good point. Basically, if you find out early on, could you get checked more regularly? And Good. Yeah, um, another benefit I would like to add is when you get, when you get detected early for cancer um, and, it's, and it hasn't spreaded yet, you, yeah. when you're able to like intervene and just like try to remove, uh, I mean, if the tumor has, any yeah. tumor has... Before it metastasizes cells. through the body. Good yeah. point. Good point. And there are mutated genes, gosh, I'll tell you, there are some called BRCA genes, women with breast cancer. There are these sets of genes where depending on which version you inherited, 
will tell you whether or not you are susceptible to a very virulent, aggressive breast cancer or not. So early diagnosis is important. Ha! Huh. Drug design. Molecular information. Structure of dysfunctional protein target. What does that mean? Remember, gang, if you've got a mutated gene, that could make a mutated what in the end? Proteins. proteins. And don't proteins do all the work? Right. Genes are lazy. They just sit in the nucleus. They don't do anything. They just like blueprint, right? Proteins do all the work. They do all the good stuff and the bad stuff. So guess what? If we can figure out the genetic differences, we can get a, we can get a head start on the messed up protein. It's called, you know, computational biology and molecular modeling. You do this all in software on the computer. It's just wild. Science and biology is just wild these days of the things you can do using software and genetic information. You can make a make a three-dimensional protein and develop a drug which sits only on that messed up protein. That's drug discovery. Well, oh, by the way, we're going to talk a little bit. I'll show you one example of this. Uh, hey, gene therapy. Replacement of a functional gene. If you have inherited one copy or two copies, what do I mean by two copies? One from mom, one from, yeah. remember? Chromosome seven, mom, dad. Oof, what if you get two mutated copies of a gene that you really need? <coughs> oh, you're in trouble. But now there are ways to deliver the correct gene into your cells using a virus. We can go on all night talking about that. That's a subject for another presentation. It's a pretty tricky thing to do. That's called gene therapy. Jumping over that. Let's go to this. Pharmacogenomics custom drugs. Folks, do you know how many lives are lost because medicine is so <coughs> crude these days? We really don't know on the molecular level what type of cancer a person has. We just know they have breast cancer. With genomics, you can understand the genes, therefore the proteins, and you can prescribe the right drug for that patient. Here's an example. Let's go through it a little bit. We'll go through this and we'll show you a, a schematic. This is called targeted medicine. Link a genetic variation to a specific disease. The goal, folks, is no longer a one-size-fits-all drug. What's a one-size-fits-all drug for cancer? It's been around for decades. Chemo. Chemo is even more sophisticated than what? Radiation therapy? Pretty crude. <laughs> Pretty crude. Ah, nowadays the goal is to use a patient's genomic information. Remember how easy it is to get your genetic information? Right? Right there. To identify molecular disease targets, for example, the right protein. Herceptin is one that's been around for a while. Herceptin, it's a molecule, it's a drug, it's, it's an antibody-based drug. Antibodies are these molecules we have, right, part of our immune system. They're really good at sticking to very specific things, like in, like bacteria or something, or mutated proteins. Uh, Herceptin is a drug that blocks a growth factor receptor on a breast tumor cell surface. I'll show you a visual. Herceptin is a drug which blocks a receptor on the surface of a tumor, so it can't grow. The blocked receptors are no longer stimulated. They don't grow. The tumor cells don't grow by the natural growth factors that we're always pumping out. So this is, a, this is actually pretty old at this point. This is an old like pharmaceutical company marketing ad. See the hammer? Antibodies look like that. Bang! It's smashing the surface of a tumor cell. It's crushing the receptor. So here's the deal. Uh, let's say this is a tumor cell. This is a nucleus. The genome is, right? Um, on the surface of the tumor cells, a lot of thousands of proteins. Let's say that this is a receptor protein right there. Guess what happens to this? This, this red molecule typically gets, it gets tickled by growth factors. It gets tickled. All right? When this thing gets tickled, guess what it says? It says, whoa, there's growth, there are growth factors out here, man. Turn on the genes, divide. And this thing keeps growing and growing and growing as cancer. Okay? That's what happens. We have growth factor receptors. We have growth factors in our body. And they tickle our tumor cells and they grow. Not good. So what did we do with modern medicine, gang? We came up with a molecule that will deliberately sit down 
only on this receptor. And it'll block the growth factor from tickling it, and the tumor cell won't grow. Now, what's the genomics in all of this? <sighs> Proteins come from what? mRNA. mRNA, which is a copy of what? A gene which lies on one of our chromosomes, right? Not every woman has the gene version that makes this molecule. Not every woman does. So if you're a physician and you have a patient with breast cancer, are you just going to prescribe Herceptin? No. Why not? Looks pretty cool to me. Why, not do the job? Why wouldn't it do the job? Speak like a scientist. Tell me like a biologist. Go ahead. Why wouldn't it do the job? No, you, just said no, you do. I can tell you do. <laughs> Go ahead. You, you put me on the spot. No, no, no. It's cool. I mean, you, you just said that some women can't, aren't, it doesn't affect them at all. They don't have that gene. Per beautiful. Good. Spoken like a scientist. I love it. Not every woman has that exact version. He's high-fiving himself. Thank you. <laughs> Your friend's high-fiving. Um, Exactly. If you cannot a priori say, oh, you're a woman and you have breast cancer, and well, I am going to guess that you have this version of the protein receptor, because I'm going to hope that you have that version of the gene. So for the next six weeks, go on Herceptin. Well, Herceptin's going to be flying around her body, right? Is it going to stick to anything? No. And guess what? I used to work in the drug industry. I used to work, good, generally. Right. I used to work in the drug industry, and one of the biggest reasons why the FDA does not just approve drugs, one of the biggest fears for the FDA is that if they approve a drug which is, doesn't work that well, that one six week or six month period of time, if the drug is not a good drug, that could be the one key window to save that person. <coughs> so if you're playing around with a drug which isn't the best drug, it's not that that drug's going to hurt the person. It's going to mean you didn't use that block of time with the best drug. That was a message I kept hearing. Hold on, hold on. That was a message I kept hearing again and again in the FDA meetings. Make sense? Possibly in the future, then, if your body sometimes cells can change over time. Mm. So if that cell does change and can accept it, mm -hmm. it might be immune to it by the way. Well, immune, it, listen, immune is not the right term, but you make a really, really good point. We, don't, we can't go into it right now, but folks, it really makes a really good point. You see this cell? Tumors don't look like that. They look like what? Clusters of millions and billions of cells? They mutate like crazy, and they change. Good point. But let's stick to what we're talking about. You must, kn you must know that patient's what before you prescribe this gang? You know. Oh, so are you going to go in and dig out the tumor and get the DNA, or do you think you could sample her genome? just from a cell from her cheek? No. Could you? No. Good. <coughs> Good. Good. Now, look at this. this we're going to talk a little <coughs> bit about finding genes. Genetic variations outside of genes, single nucleotide polymorphisms called SNPs, OK? SNPs are small genetic variations between individuals. Uh, let's say this is uh, the bottom of chromosome 17. And it turns out that it's not even in a gene, gang, but there's a single nucleotide polymorphism. It's a fancy, word, fancy way of saying it's a, a nucleotide change. Many people have a G. For some reason, some people have a T. It's not even in a gene, folks. Trust me, there are 20,000 genes, but all of the DNA in between genes is like junk DNA. So it's been around from our evolution. It's not used anymore. It's vestigial. But we have these things called SNPs. And these SNPs can actually, if you, there's an actual map of these specific SNPs across our genome. <coughs> a SNP can be a marker of a disease. You have to get this. It's outside the disease gene not even in the gene. The gene's over here somewhere. But it's linked to the gene due to the proximity on the chromosome. OK? This is a tricky, this is kind of abstract. It's tricky. A SNP is a marker of disease. It's outside, outside of the disease gene, but it's linked to the gene, physically linked, gang, due to the proximity on the chromosome. 
And when, you, when, when your mom gave you chromosome 4, she typically gave you the, her entire chromosome 4, right? She didn't just give you one gene on chromosome 4. She gave you the whole chromosome 4. So I want you to understand something. When you inherit genes from your parents, you inherit huge chunks of chromosomes. You don't just get a gene from dad. You typically get his whole chromosome 7 or 10. Big chunks. When you see some commonalities between people, races that are related, it's because they share huge chunks of chromosome. That's why they have some physical characteristics that are similar. Yeah? So we have the same type of chromosome from mother and father. How come um, like a, a child would look more like the father than the mother? Oh, it's a good question. I don't think we have the answer to it necessarily, but it depends on sometimes if you get a dominant gene or a recessive gene yes. from mom or dad, like eye color and stuff. It's very complicated, but towards the end of this talk, I think you'll realize that there are many factors involved in turning genes on and genes off, okay? Now, here's the deal. SNPs are really easily detected in a DNA sample. They're tags. Remember we talked about having a little marker that could sit down on stuff? We can, have a, we can have a marker that sits down only on a SNP that we can find on chromosome 4. There are really good ways to identify if you've inherited a chunk of DNA that's associated with a disease. So let me back up for a minute. Let's say there was some disease state, right, or some, some kind of characteristic that a group of people shared, but we haven't found the gene for it yet. But they all, every single person of those 600 you sample that have the same phenotypic structural characteristic, they all had the same SNPs on the bottom of chromosome <coughs> 15. You have 500 people that share some disease pathology, some trait. They all have the same SNPs, markers, on the bottom of chromosome 15 that other people that don't have the same characteristic, they don't have those SNPs. What do you think is there among the hundreds of genes at the bottom of chromosome 15? <coughs> Probably a genetic variation in a gene or two that's giving rise to the trait. Yes? Is this translocation? You can, during meiosis, and you can have crossing over, and you can have things like that, but we're not going to talk about that yet. What we're talking about here is how can you look at a group of people that share one <coughs> trait, one characteristic, scan their entire genome, look for a, something that's similar. <coughs> Now, what's similar among those 500 people? Do they share that physical trait? Do they? Yes and you scanned their entire genome of every one of them, and they all have the same set of SNPs at the bottom of chromosome 15. Would that suggest that there's something that they all share at the bottom of chromosome 15? So you're ready to grab the gene, right? No, because there are hundreds of genes at the bottom of chromosome 15, and it ain't that simple. Now, that's how they found the gene for cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis was the gene was found by whole genome scanning. What they did is they took a whole bunch of people who had cystic fibrosis and they looked, they looked across the genome of all of these individuals and they compared them to people that didn't have cystic fibrosis and guess what? All of the people with cystic fibrosis, when they looked at all of the genetic information across all 23 pairs of chromosomes using what? Genomics? Markers? Remember folks, we have markers up and down every one of our chromosomes. They're all known. Human Genome Project. Our genome has been sequenced. When they looked at the cystic fibrosis patients, they were just like non-cystic fibrosis people at every single region except for one chunk on one chromosome. For example, let's say only in this stretch of this chromosome, all of the people with cystic fibrosis had the same SNPs. The same Little markers, meaning they all inherited a similar chunk of the human genome, which had hundreds of great genes 
but also had one what? One mutated gene that gave rise to cystic fibrosis. You take 500 cystic fibrosis patients, you, you get some DNA from them, you scan their genome, you do it to 500 people without cystic fibrosis, they're all the same, except the scientists determined right in one chunk of one chromosome, every single cystic fibrosis patient had the same little markers. It told them that, oh my goodness, all of these people have inherited a very similar chunk of the human genome, which likely contains one gene which has a mutation, right, which leads to this physical characteristic. Cystic fibrosis was easy because it was rare, gang. One gene mutated made one messed up protein, leading to a disease condition. The problem is, can we find the LD gene? Do you know how rare it is to have one disease condition caused by one defective gene? Very rare. Very rare. So, the problem, folks, is that like intelligence or height, do you think intelligence or height are ascribed to one gene or a bunch of genes? Bunch of genes. That's the problem. Cystic fibrosis, we were lucky that one gene caused one disease. <coughs> it is a sequence that they detected. You got it. Yep, good question. Is having an LD connected to some kind of, oh, I don't know what you said, some kind of, not a mutation, like some kind of something that went wrong inside the body with the gene? Mm. Something, like something like a mistake? Probably not. It's probably just the genetic diversity we all have and how it okay. manifests in different, yeah. You know, we use the term neurodiversity a lot. We're also different. Probably not. We're just different enough. <laughs> and, you know, it's not a life-threatening condition. Right? It's just our genetic diversity and how we all learn differently and process things differently. That's probably more like it. But good point. The point here is that, folks, you're not going to find one gene. You might find one gene which is linked to ADD or something like that. But, uh, but guess what? There are going to be dozens of other factors involved. Let's go into that, and we're nearing the end of the talk. Hey, to complicate matters further, guess what there is? There's this thing called epigenetics. Just when you thought you understood it, okay, we'll sequence the genes, we'll know every gene, we'll know every mutated gene, we'll know every messed up protein, we'll get a, we'll get a drug for everyone. Epigenetics is when change to DNA, for example, methylation, which is a way of slightly changing um, a DNA molecule, not changing the A's and the T's and C's and G's, but changing it physically a little bit, not a gene sequence per se affects gene expression. Stop. Gene expression was, was when a gene gets turned on, right? From a gene to mRNA to protein. There's something called epigenetics where, oh my goodness, our cells can actually do things to our genes which will turn them on or off. They won't change the sequence of the gene. We're not talking about nucleotide changes. This is the phenomenon that actually helps create the different cells and tissues of our body. When we start as a fertilized uh, egg, as an embryo, uh, as the embryo develops, suddenly some of these cells become what? Neurons? Others kidney cells? Others skin cells? Right? It is believed that this thing called epigenetics, which is a way a cell has of turning genes on and off, really tell, has a huge part in making you who you are. So just when you thought all we had to do was sequence the genome, guess what? There's this entire level of other control of our genetics and our proteomics called epigenetics. Oh, my goodness. So it's unbelievable. Let's talk about some stuff here. Do all clinicians and healthcare professionals know about this technology, pharmacogenomics and stuff? Do you think they all know about this? Eh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, is this treatment, this, uh, this targeted therapy, is this um, affordable to insurance companies? I don't think so. It's really expensive. It brings us to LC and genetic information, ethical issues. When you know someone's, gene, some, someone's genetic makeup, um, stem cell research, whole animal cloning, organ farming, There's a line between medical treatment and enhancement, cosmeceuticals. There are ethical issues associated with knowing your genetic information. Do you all know what animal, whole animal cloning is? Yes. Good. All right. It's when you take the entire genome of something and you pop it into an empty egg 
and you cultivate that egg and it turns into an embryo, and you no longer have a hybrid, you have an exact copy. Everybody get that? All right, good. Elsie, legal, genetic information, privacy issues, government, insurance companies, courtroom use. So there are legal repercussions to having your genome sequence known. And I'll tell you in a minute why it's so dicey. Social issues. Will we use genetic information by schools, by employers? And also, who can afford pharmacogenomics? What's the effect of all of this on society if only the rich can afford this sort of advanced care? There's the issues. Look at this. All right. Let's just say we, through molecular biology and genomics, we can do a genotype determination and find out that someone there has a copy of the sociopath gene. What's, what's a sociopath? What's a sociopath do? Yeah. Uh, someone that, uh, that's been investigated and care Perfect. Good. Somebody who has these tendencies to break the law, not care much. What if there's some sense that some scientists have found a gene which they think le makes a protein which gives you tendencies towards sociopathic behavior. Huh, all right. And you get your genome sequence and lo and behold, you have it. Uh-oh. Is it this simple? Well, don't forget, what about epigenetics? What if you have this, what if you have this gene copy, but it's not turned on because of how your body turns on and controls your genes? Also, Folks, don't forget, like height or intelligence, for every gene, there are dozens of modifier genes that affect your trait. You find one gene, makes a protein, and guess what? There are dozens of other genes all across your genome making proteins that together determine this complex trait. So if, if we're not careful, we can, we can link ge genetic sequences to certain conditions but on the genetic information alone, does that mean you're a sociopath? You're going to be a sociopath? Are your two-year-old's going to be a sociopath? I think my two-year-old's going to be a sociopath. That's <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> oh, thank you. All right, good. All right, and then they're all in trouble. Um, see what I mean, folks? It's that you might show up positive. Now, folks, think outside the box for a minute. What if you end up with a gene sequence which is tied to Alzheimer's? But we're not done figuring out Alzheimer's, are we? You may never develop Alzheimer's because you inherited 27 other genes which make proteins which completely compensate and counteract the effects of that gene. You'll never get it. But guess what? At 27 years old, you tested positive for the Alzheimer gene. Guess what you were thinking about the rest of your life? Alzheimer's? Yep. You see that? Do you see how tricky it is? What if you have the version of the gene which is linked to Alzheimer's or, or, or cancer or behavior, with a but there's no treatment? Should clinicians tell you if there's no treatment? If you, you can go, we can talk about that all night, right? So, understanding the genetic variability is really, really, really important to healthcare. The more we know about the human genome and genomics, the more we'll be able to home in on blocks of chromosomes we inherit to find that gene and genes which make messed up proteins so we can design drugs. There's no doubt about it. And boy, is it easy to get your hands on genetic information, right? It's all through this room. Identifying DNA mutations associated with disease helps with diagnosis, prevention, and treatment. It really does. <coughs> Powerful stuff. Understanding genetic variability, remember those SNPs and all the changes across our genome that we inherit. They may not even be in a gene. They're very important in many other fields. For example, forensics. If you've got a crime scene and you've got a bunch of genetic markers for the Y chromosome, and you swab that blood and there's an, you use all this molecular biology and you cannot detect that genetic marker from, that's specific for the Y chromosome, 
Who can you exclude from as the donor of that blood? Y chromosome. Male, males. Good. Got it? Really important for forensics. All right, due to the Human Genome Project, pretty soon our individual sequences will be known, right? They'll be on your iPhone, right? You scan them and stuff. Your, 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 your doctor will, will have your entire genetic sequence. Are you comfortable with that? Why not? Why not? He's my doctor. <laughs> hey. That means anyone else can access it. Are we prepared as a society to handle this information? You say move forward? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just because somebody knows doesn't mean like, like just think of what could happen if everybody knew. Mm. I mean, it could be bad, but at the same time. From your social security they have even more information now. So they can even steal your whole physical identity. Yeah, but also look at it as a positive thing. Good. I didn't set this is perfect. I didn't set this little debate up. Yeah. Is it possible to um, take some of the genetic information and create a mimic of it from um, other, part, other genes? Make mm. a strand of DNA that looks like someone else's based off mm. the information? Really great thought. Um, our genome is so huge, it would be physically, structurally difficult to do, okay? But I know where you're heading with that. And, and remember the term synthetic biology I used? Um, People are piecing together entire genomes of um, single-celled organisms, and they're cre recreating them in a lab, an entire organism. So, so theoretically, in the future, you could commit a crime and uh, use some blood or DNA at the scene that's genetically manipulated to put someone else and put it on them? You could. It'd probably be easier to carry somebody else's blood around with you and splash it around <laughs> the crime. <laughs> I'm not kidding. But, 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 but br brilliant. I like it. Who is that? It's not Rory, is it? <laughs> yeah. All right. But, yeah. Is yeah. it possible to cure disease with a uh, mutation itself? Um, oh. uh, speak, uh, speak, uh, speaking specifically to the uh, CCR5 mutation that uh, is present, I believe it's like 1% of the population that prevents from AIDS. But there was a case of one man, I think it was actually two now, that have been ever cured of AIDS. One man, I believe it was in the 90s, um, mm -hmm. he got a bone marrow transplant, and he gained this mutation. <laughs> Interesting. Was it CD4 or something like that? Uh, CC, CCR. Okay. Well, you know, it's funny because you know, AIDS is AIDS is of course a, a syndrome, right? Acquired yeah. immunodeficiency syndrome is, is caused by HIV, right? So probably not cured of AIDS, cured of an HIV infection is what you mean, right, Nils? Yes. Yes. Good. Um, the news just the news tonight of a, a two-year-old, two and a half-year-old being. Uh, eight. Now, of course, be, be careful because you know babies, young kids, they have a much different immune system. The feeling is that HIV. The, tr the drugs given to fight back that virus, that retrovirus, um, in that organism, that baby, um, at, the at that time, it prevented the HIV from ha having a reservoir, living in all these T helper cells and stuff like that. But still, it's a huge breakthrough. You know, um, I don't know if this is what you're talking about, Nils, but there's something called molecular mimicry, where the drug you make is actually the same screwed up protein that's on a tumor cell. You actually provide it. So guess what the virus comes and grabs? Instead of grabbing the real receptor, it grabs a, the fake version you made. So, you know, the virus is looking for this receptor, right? Yeah. It wants to find it on your healthy T helper cells, like HIV. But you start providing a, a, a copy of that messed up receptor all through your body with nanotechnology. And the virus goes down on the fake one and occupies itself. Interesting. Very interesting. Yes? Um, what do you think about gene engineering and diversity? What do you mean by that? Well, so we're, Benson. we're uh, in the process of sort of weeding out all the bad genes and trying oh. to pinpoint these different parts of the human genome that we mm -hmm. consider bad. And by mm -hmm. messing with them, we're pretty much, we're going to affect diversity and mm. expression. What, what do you do? You well, you know, it's pretty hard to weed them all out. I think, you know, um, you know, nobody really blocks them. And of course, we don't have a lot of control over who procreates, right? And who, honestly, who has kids with whomever. And so... Um, I don't think we are. I don't think we are at a point where we're really. We, it's a great question where we're weeding them out necessarily, um, but uh, you know, I think we're. I think, I think the danger comes. The danger comes maybe when we are in a position to screen, like you know, you know, like embryos, like in vitro fertilization. We screen those embryos right now. They may have be only made of eight eight cells. We can pluck a cell and look for the mutation for a certain gene and not choose that embryo to put 
in the, in the mom. That's done today. It's been done for a long time. It's, Benson, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's when we start looking for genes tied to athleticism, you know what I mean? And say, I want that embryo. You know? We're like, like, why? Well, because I heard that good athletes have those genes. That's the slippery slope of genetic engineering. Good question. By the way, there's a whole field of blocking mRNA, blocking gene expression by doing nothing else than by making a copy of another molecule that sits down on the mRNA molecule so the protein's never made. This is a way to fight off viruses. None of this would be possible if you didn't know the sequence of the genome, and that's the power of genomics. Yeah? So, uh, do we know why, like, specific gene sequences are compartmentalized by chromosome? Right? Like, we know there's, like, X and Y in terms yeah. of sex. I don't know yeah. if it, like, does stuff other than that, but do we know, like, what, like, if at all, if it's, like, organized by topic when they decide, like... Oh, gosh. It, it like, is... or is it just completely random? Oh, what a fascinating question that is. I, I, of course, I have no idea. I don't know how we've evolved all these years to go from X numbers of chromosomes to probably mistakes, you know, from millions of years ago as organisms. Um, I'm not really sure, but lots of swapping happens through meiosis and mitosis. And good thing it does, because if nothing happened to our genomes, right, we'd be what? We'd be wiped out by pathogens. Do you see how important genetic diversity is? It's only through the diversity of our species, including neurodiversity, that we can withstand different, you know, pressures on us as organisms on the planet. So, mutations are actually a good thing, except when they lead to, you know, some sort of an illness. Um, so, genomics, powerful field, it's going to affect every single one of us. Take home message, be very careful, it's never as simple as it seems. If you think there's a gene for something, it's never that simple. Biology is impossibly complex. And uh, it'll be a long time before we find the genes for dyslexia, ASD, ADHD, gifted LD, anything, right? Let alone height or intelligence, but we're, all, but we're getting there. And it, it should enlighten society if we use it the right way. <coughs> that was supposed to be my final thing. I'm supposed oh, to go out on I time. Know, yeah. Go ahead, the professor. <laughs> Whole animal, you mentioned whole animal cloning. Yeah, yeah. And you know, ever since they started doing that, they cloned this animal, that yeah. animal, was a little less. Yeah. I've been thinking, there's got to be guys out there in secret labs. Yeah. They're trying to do that with humans. I mean, do you yeah. think that that is actually happening? The guys that have beat that guy's men, but people. Probably not over in the FAB. We need the new <laughs> science center, <laughs> of course, before we do it. But the. Um, <laughs> you're not, what are you. <laughs> that's right, professional development money. Uh, you know, I mean, the whole thing with Dolly the sheep, remember, you, you guys were young kids, Dolly the sheep, it used old chromosomes, and that's why Dolly couldn't reproduce and why she was prematurely old. You know, I'm, a, I'm cynical by nature. Um, I wouldn't doubt it if there's a lot of experimentation going on to push the envelope that's not federally funded. Um, you can do a lot of this stuff in your basement. Molecular biology these days, I'm not kidding. Where do you see, I mean, detecting genes and stuff, it's, it's pretty routine these days. It's a really, it's a really... Uh, powerful time uh, to do this sort of stuff. Whole animal cloning, it's very difficult, but... Um, well, they'll clone your dead pet for it, right? I mean, there's 20 yeah. You know something? I, I swear, I had a... This is the last point. I had a beloved cat. I had a cat I loved so much. He was 18 years old. He finally died. And I loved him, loved him, loved him. And since I have the burden of knowledge, which is science, I contemplated saving some of his fur. Alistair is his name. And I was going to keep it in the freezer just in case. What if 20 years from now it came up and this was a service for 2,500 bucks, you can clone your cat? And I think, why didn't I do it? I know biology. <laughs> but then I moved and I left it in the freezer or something for someone else. <laughs> but um, hey, folks, thank you very much. You've been a great crowd. <laughs> <laughs>